This is the fourth video in a series that I'm making to support a course in complex analysis. And we're still working through the basics. And by the basics, I mean the arithmetic of complex numbers and some basic functions that are defined on the complex numbers as well as their behavior. So far, we've looked at the square function. So it takes z and gives us z squared as well as the square root function and its two branches. So today we're gonna to look at the exponential function and then the logarithm function as well as its infinitely many branches as we'll see. So we'll start with the exponential function. So this is the number that the function that takes z and gives us e to the z, where that e is obviously Euler's constant. So let's notice a little bit of behavior that comes immediately. So if we decompose z into a real part and an imaginary part, so it's x plus i y, then e to the z using exponent rules is e to the x e to the i y. But we know that e to the i y is on the unit circle and e to the x is a real number. So from that we can immediately see that the modulus of the e to the z is e to the x. Notice I don't need absolute values or anything over here and that's because e to a real number is always positive or I guess yeah always positive. Furthermore the argument of z is equal to e to the z is equal to y. So the argument of e to the z is the same thing as the imaginary part of z. I think that's pretty interesting. Furthermore, because of this behavior up here, as well as the decomposition of the e to the i y into cosine y plus i sine y, we see that e to the z has a period of 2 pi i. So let's get a picture going of what happens when we take something in the z plane and map it into the w, which is e to the z plane. So I've notated this here as the mapping where z is sent to e to the z. We're gonna start by focusing on what happens to horizontal lines. So what I mean by that is what if we start with a horizontal line over here in the domain, apply our mapping, what will we get over here in the codomain? Okay, so let's see it. Let's maybe start with something easy, like the real axis. So I'll just highlight the real axis in yellow. So notice, for the real axis, the imaginary part is always zero. And so here, we're just getting e to the x. But, like we talked about before, e to the x is always positive. So we're going to end up with something over here that has positive real part and zero imaginary part. Well, notice that's just going to be the ray. Maybe it could be called the open ray starting at the origin, not including the origin, and going out the positive real axis. Notice we cannot achieve the point zero over here. And that's because e to anything is never equal to zero. Okay, so now let's look at some more. Let's maybe go up here to i times pi and see what we get. So let's draw a horizontal line here at i times pi. Now we're mapping a complex number whose imaginary part is pi over via this exponential part. Remember that the exponential map turns the imaginary part into the argument. That means the image over here of this blue line will always have an argument of pi. But an argument of pi means we are on the negative real axis. So that's going to go over in this direction. Okay, so that's looking good. So notice we've got this horizontal line up here gets mapped to the negative real axis. This real axis here gets mapped to the positive real axis. And maybe let's throw this in for good measure as well. Notice that down here, this e to the minus i pi will also be mapped to this negative real axis as well. That's because of this periodicity here. And also because the angle minus pi just sends us right back to the same point. Okay, so now let's go somewhere in the middle. Let's maybe go right here at i, at I pi over two. So this is the horizontal line where the imaginary part is always pi over two. So that's gonna be mapped to a set of points over here where the argument is always pi over two. But the set of points where the argument is always pi over two is exactly equal to this positive imaginary axis. So that means we've got this horizontal line here being mapped to that 
positive imaginary axis. And then likewise, if we did maybe minus i pi over 2, that would be maybe kind of the next obvious thing to do. So minus i pi over 2. That's going to be mapped to points over there where the argument is always minus pi over 2. So that'll be this negative imaginary axis. And now we can start filling in some more. Let's maybe do i pi over 4. So that would be like this horizontal line right here. So again, the imaginary part is going to turn into the argument. So that means the image of this pink line will be everything over there that has argument pi over 4. But that'll be this ray right here that goes at a pi over 4 angle. Maybe let's point this out that this is a pi over 4 angle just for good measure. Okay, so let's maybe put one more in just so that we can really get a feel for what's going on. Let's maybe put one in right here. I'll do it in purple. And this is at i 3 pi over 4. So that means this is all the points with imaginary part 3 pi over 4. That's going to be mapped over here to points where the argument is 3 pi over 4. But that's going to be like a 45 degree angle between this positive imaginary axis and this negative real axis. So if we were to measure it like that, that's like an angle of 3 pi over 4. So I guess the takeaway here will be that horizontal lines, so let's write this down so that we know exactly what's going on here. So horizontal lines get mapped to, under this exponential function, rays from the origin. And I guess I should say we're not including the origin, but I'll just say that in words. Notice that we're never able to actually land on the origin. So just to reiterate, we've got horizontal lines here in the domain are mapped to rays from the origin over there in the codomain under this mapping z is sent to e to the z. Okay, so let's clean this up and then we'll play the same game but with vertical lines. We just investigated what happens to horizontal lines under our exponential map. Now we'll look at what happens with vertical lines. So like we did before, we started with the simplest horizontal line. So let's start with the simplest vertical line. And that simplest vertical line would just be the imaginary axis. So there we've got the imaginary axis here. So maybe let's point out that the imaginary axis will be all points of the form 0 plus i, y. And y can be anything. Well, since y can be anything here, and the exponential function turns the imaginary part into the argument, that means the argument over here can be anything as well. But let's notice that the modulus is equal to the exponential evaluated at the real part. The real part is fixed. That means the modulus of everything along this line will be equal to 1. So let's just sketch that out. So this goes to the point e to the 0, which is 1, and then e to the i, y, which is on a circle. Well, it's on a circle, radius 1, because e to the 0 is 1. So here we get a circle of radius 1. So we could write it like that. So let's maybe do a couple more just to get a feel for how this is going on. Let's maybe take the line which has real coordinate 1 maybe. So this is all points of the form 1 plus i, y. So notice that's going to be mapped to e to the 1, e to the i, y. And now again, since the imaginary part is anything here, the argument is anything over here. And since the real part is fixed at 1, the modulus is always e to the 1. Well, if the modulus is always e to the 1 and the argument can be anything, then we have another circle. This time, the circle is of radius e. So we have something like this. So let's point out that this goes through the number 1, this goes through the number e along the real axis. Okay, let's maybe do one more. Let's go back here to the point negative 1, draw a vertical line. So if we've got a vertical line there, negative 1, so this is everything of the form one, negative 1 plus i, y, as y trends between anything, 
Well, mapping that, we'll get e to the minus 1 i y. That means our modulus is always e to the minus 1 or 1 over e. And then our argument is anything. So that gives us a circle of radius 1 over e. So maybe it would be something like this. So this would be the point 1 over e here. So if we saw before that horizontal lines get, get mapped to rays from the origin, now we've seen that vertical lines get mapped to circles centered at the origin. Okay, so let's get rid of this picture and then we'll draw maybe a summary picture for both of these actions. Okay, so as a quick summary of our picture before, let's recall that horizontal lines turn into rays coming from the origin. So let's see, this line right here would be, so let's see, this line right here would maybe be pi over 4, this is 3 pi over 4, and this is 3 pi over 2. That will give us this ray, this ray, and this ray. Then vertical lines are mapped to circles. So maybe this would be like negative 1, 0, and 1 like we had before. So this has radius 1 over e, 1, and e. Okay, so this is a nice picture. <coughs> Okay, so this is an important picture to remember, especially when we move to inverting it, in other words, looking at the logarithm function. But before we do that, let's do an example. So now let's look at a couple of examples. These are classic examples of sketching the region under the plane mapped under this exponential function. So let's say our first region is the region of all points where the real part is between zero and two. So the real part between 0 and 2 will be a vertical strip. So here, let's draw that. So that would be like the real part being 0, the y-axis, or the imaginary axis. This would be like the real part being 2. That would be the vertical line, which is like x equals 2. So here, we'll just put a 2 right here. And I've dotted them because we do not have a... <clears throat> because we have a strict inequality here. Okay, so that means that we can shade everything in here, and that is the region described by this inequality. Okay, so let's see what happens to the boundary first. The boundary is not included, so we'll dot that. So this is a vertical line on the left part of the boundary. We know vertical lines go to circles. This will go, go to a circle of radius e to the 0 or 1. So we can dot that in right here. So there's our circle of radius 1. Then this guy over here on the right will go to a circle of radius e squared. So this will be something like this. So let's write this is e squared. This is the number 1. And then everything in the middle will get mapped to everything in this open annulus right here. So this is our picture. It's going to be this open annulus between circles of radius 1 and e squared. Okay, let's do one more. Now let's look at another example where we take all the points z whose modulus is less than pi over 4. Well, that's going to be a circle with radius pi over 4 and then everything inside. So it's a disk radius pi over 4. And here I've added the inclusion of pi over 4 just to make it a little bit easier to draw. Okay, so like I said, this is going to be a disk of radius pi over 4. So there we have something like this. Now let's put some points along this disk to figure out where those points get mapped. So I'll put this point right here, which is pi over 4. This guy right here, which is i times pi over 4. This point right here, which is negative pi over 4. And this point down here, which is minus i times pi over 4. And now let's see where each of these gets mapped. So the point pi over 4 will be mapped to the point e to the pi over 4. Maybe we'll write that over here so we'll color code it. So this is a yellow dot. Now e to the, or sorry, minus pi over 4 will be, get mapped to e to the minus pi over 4. That'll be actually fairly close to 0 because minus pi over 4 is obviously negative. e to a negative number will be smaller than 1. So that's going to be over there. Now let's look at these two. So this guy right here will get mapped to e to the i pi over 4. Notice that's on the unit circle. That's on the unit circle with an argument of pi over 4. In other words, its angle is pi over 4. 
So that's going to be somewhere right around here. Furthermore, this purple one by symmetry will kind of be down here. Now you could collect more points if you wanted to, but I think this is enough to maybe draw it. It might look a little bit like a circle, but it's not quite a circle. It's kind of heavier over here on the left. In other words, it's thicker over here on the left and thinner over there on the right. And now we can use Mathematica to sketch some images of curves very quickly just to get a feel for what's going on here. And then when we come back, we'll look at the logarithm function. Mathematica to look at some examples of the image of some certain curves in the complex plane under the function f of z equals e to the z. So let's see our setup. So like in the last video, we're going to be using this real imaginary part function that, like it did before, it makes a list which has the first component, the real part of z, and the second component, the imaginary part of z. So as you see, it takes 4 plus 3i to 4 comma 3. So you can think of that like an ordered pair for graphing. And we'll also use the parametric plot function, which plots parametrically defined curves. So notice this is clearly the parameterization of a circle, and that's what we get. Okay, so finally let's define our function f of z equals e to the z to work with as we go forward and look at each of these curves. So the first one is a parabola, so we can parameterize a parabola where the x part is equal to t and the y part is equal to t squared. In other words, the real part is t and the imaginary part is t squared. So if we graph that, well, we get the parabola, which is good, and now let's graph its image. Okay, so I think that's a pretty interesting picture. Um, now let's keep going. So let's look at this example right here, which is y equals 2x minus 5. So we can parameterize that similarly, since we have an x and a y part, y is defined as a function of x. So there we get as we would expect, the line with a slope of 2 and a y-intercept of negative 5. My origin is a little bit weird. It's not set at the origin, but that's okay. And now let's see what we get for the parametric plot. So we get this cool spiral, which makes sense if you think about a spiral as being somewhere in between a ray from the origin and a circle. And recall that horizontal lines were sent to rays and vertical lines were sent to circles. And a diagonal line is somewhere in between a horizontal line and a vertical line. And a spiral is somewhere in between a circle and a ray. Okay, so now let's look at this next example, which is a hyperbola. Actually, we'll only get one sheet of the hyperbola, but that's okay. So this is x squared minus y squared equals 1. So that can be parameterized with the hyperbolic cosine. And then the hyperbolic sine, this gives us the right part of the hyperbola. Now if we look at the graph of this, we get this nice kind of looping action. So I'll let you guys think about what's exactly going on with the formula for e to the z to make this happen. You can just write down e to the z evaluated at this hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine and decompose it into real and imaginary parts to get an idea of what's going on here. So for one last example, let's look at y equals the absolute value of x. So we can parameterize that with t and then i absolute value of t. So let's see. Okay, so we get the standard graph for the absolute value, and here is the graph for the image. So as you can see, we're getting some sort of spiraling behavior in each of these halves, and then a sharp corner here at the real point, which is equal to 1. But let's recall that the real point, which is equal to 1, is the image of the origin under the exponential map, so that this makes sense. Okay, so now we're ready to look at the logarithm function. Now that we've looked at the exponential function, let's look, look a little bit at the logarithm function. So for non-zero z, let's define the log z, where z is a complex number, as the natural log, like from calculus class, of the modulus of z, plus i times the argument of z, plus 2 pi i m. So this is a multi-valued function. It takes on infinitely many values. That m ranges over all integers, and the argument is taken to be maybe the principal argument, which is between negative pi and pi, including pi but not negative pi. Furthermore, there's a special version of this where we take m to be equal to zero. That's called the principal branch of the logarithm. We'll denote that by capital L-O-G-Z. 
So that's just natural log of modulus of z plus i argument of z. So that's single valued. So let's look at some examples real quick. So let's look at the log of minus one. Well, notice that's gonna be the same thing as the ln of one, because that's the modulus of minus one, plus i times pi. So that i times pi comes from the fact that minus one is equal to e to the i pi. So pi is the argument of minus one, and then plus i two pi m. So in other words, we have i pi plus two pi i m. Putting it all together because natural log of one is equal to zero. Okay, so let's maybe do another one. Let's maybe do the log of one plus i. Now notice that's gonna be the same thing as the natural log of the modulus of one plus i plus, well, the argument of one plus i, well, we can calculate that. Well, the argument of one plus i, that's a number we've played with from time to time. We know the argument is pi over four. So this is i pi over four plus two pi i m. So we need to calculate this logarithm of the modulus of one plus i. The modulus of one plus i is the square root of two. So this gives us natural log of the square root of two plus i pi over four plus two pi i m. If we wanted to simplify this a little bit, maybe look at the principal branch, we could say capital L-O-G one plus I is equal to half natural log of two using exponent rules plus I pi over four. It's kind of a nice succinct way to write it. So now that we've done a couple of basic examples, let's take inspiration from the pictures we made before of the exponential function to get a set of pictures for this logarithm function. Okay, so the problem with graphing the log function is that it's either multi-valued or it's not onto. Notice that this guy right here will only have imaginary part between negative pi and pi. But if we wanted to create something that was onto and well-defined as a single value function, maybe we'd have to do something similar to what we did with the square root function and look at a lot of different copies of this function and somehow glue them together. And that's what we're gonna do here. So here we have the principal branch. So Z gets mapped to capital log Z. Here Z is mapped to capital log Z plus two pi I. So that would be like taking M equals one here. Down here would be Z mapped to capital log Z minus two pi I. And this, this stack extends infinitely in that direction and infinitely down there as well because this M ranges over all integers. So let's maybe start with the principal branch. So we'll take this ray right here, it's pi over four. This one right here will be three pi over four, and this one will be negative pi over two. So we need to remove the origin there because we can't take log of zero. That's the one value that we cannot evaluate at log. Now, this pi over four will go to a horizontal line based at pi over four. I pi over four, I should say. This will go to a horizontal line at I three pi over four. This will be negative I pi over two. So this will go to this line right here, this line right here, and then this line down here. Okay, and that's from this principal branch. So let's see what happens up here if we have the same set of rays coming from the branch that is shifted up by two pi i. So if it's shifted up by two pi i, we just get this same collection of horizontal lines, but they have been shifted up by two pi i. So we get something that looks like that. So now what happens if we look at the same set of rays down here? but the rays down here now have been shifted down to pi i. So that'll give us something like this down here. Now something a little bit more interesting is happening with circles. So a circle of radius one here will not be mapped to the entire imaginary axis because the imaginary values of the output here can only be between negative pi i and pi i. So that means it looks something like this. So it goes from here with an open circle up to here with a closed circle. So that would be the map of this blue circle. Now let's do a circle of radius one here and we'll get a similar picture, except now we'll have an open circle at this and then shading all the way up to a closed circle up here. And then finally, if we look at a circle of radius one down here, 
we will have a closed circle here going down to an open circle here. And so the logarithm function will take these circles, depending on the branch, to little line segments that are half open over there in the image. So now we'd like to talk about how to glue all these copies of the logarithm together into one cohesive function. And the way that we can do that is to remove the negative imaginary axis from all of these and then label the above it with a plus and below it with a minus. So we'll do that on all of these copies of the complex plane, which represent all of the different branches of the logarithm function. Okay, so we're cutting out the imaginary axis or the negative imaginary axis. And from here, what we'll do is slightly distort these and then glue them together. But we've got an infinite copy of each of these, so that'll give us something like an infinite spiral. So maybe I'll put a picture on the screen right now of what that infinite spiral looks like, and then we'll end with some warm-up exercises. Okay, so now we're gonna re repeat some of these examples with the logarithm function. So I won't go through this bit because we just did that um, previously, but I will redefine or I will define find the function g of z to be the log of z. Notice I'm using capital L-O-G. That's because, well, one thing, Mathematica always use, uses capital letters for its built-in constants and functions, but also this is the principal branch. Okay, so we're gonna go through the same curves. So there we've got y equals x squared again, the parabola, and so look at the image. So I think that's pretty interesting. It's like asymptoting down here to zero in the negative direction, or sorry, down here, and then it's asymptoting. That's probably something like pi up here. Maybe we'll extend this to see what's happening to the right. Okay, maybe we'll extend it a little bit further to seven, and then maybe here we'll go negative seven. Oh, negative seven. Okay, so that seems to be having a horizontal asymptote for each of these sheets at, that's probably like pi over two. So that probably has to do with this half of the parabola is one of those, and then this half over here of the parabola is another one. Okay, so let's look at the image of this line y equals 2x minus 5. So let's recall the exponential function took rays from the origin, or sorry, took um, horizontal lines to rays from the origin. So the logarithm function goes in the opposite direction, so we should think about that as we're looking at this map. Okay, so that's interesting. We get like a parabola facing to the right. Okay, now let's look at our hyperbola. So we've got, again, parameterized the same way and the image under the logarithm. Well, maybe it's not super interesting. It still looks like basically the same shape. And now finally, the absolute value function. So this one should be pretty clear because this has a fixed um, argument and because this has some sort of fixed argument so let's see what we get for that and it is clear we get two horizontal lines so let's see these two horizontal lines are corresponding to this ray right here and this ray right here so down here this is at about pi over four so this will be this branch of the absolute value function, and this over here is about three pi over four, so that's this branch of the absolute value function. Okay, so now back to some warm-up problems. So I'm gonna leave you guys with some warm-up problems to practice what we've seen here. The first is to plot the image of the rectangle 0, 1 cross 0 pi over two under our exponential map, which takes z to e to the z. The next is to show that the complex conjugate of e to the z is the same thing as e to the complex conjugate of z. So I think this is some nice result here that you can bring this bar inside the exponential in this case. Next, plot the image of the vertical line x to the e under the principal branch of the logarithm function. 
And then finally, show this inverse function relationship, e to the log z is equal to z. And this is for any branch of this logarithm function. Maybe as a little additional question is, what happens if we do the composition in the other order? Need we take the principal branch in that case, or will any branch work? And that's a good place to stop.